Hare Krishna, I was asked to explain how I joined the Hare Krishna movement and in order for me to do that I have to go over my whole life history practically. I was born in Montreal, Canada in 1952 and uh, it was French Canada. When the, the English and the French fought for Canada, the French lost the battle except that uh, Montreal never fell. So the English signed the treaty with, with the French people and Montreal was left untouched. And from Montreal, all the French multiplied and, and colonized the whole province. But they made sure for 500 years that they never learned how to speak English. They never gave up, gave up their religion, which was uh, the Catholic Church. And they, they kept their culture like that. So they, they never mixed with the English people. So I was, I was raised very racist. I was raised to hate the English. And my mother thought like that. My neighbors thought like that. My teachers th thought like that. The, the whole community was raising you as a, as a racist, you know, French racist. And because we had been abandoned by, by France, we even hated the French people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we were still flying the flag of the king of, of France, even though the king had been guillotined and there was a French Revolution going on in France, and we, we still spoke how they, they speak French 500 years ago in Canada. So a very antique, archaic type of French. Anyhow, the thing is, what, what was nice about the time that I, I, I was living there is that we were studying a Bible that was 500 years old and it had an imprimatur of the Vatican. And in that Bible, they, they taught reincarnation. And on top of it, we had all kinds of books on the lives of, of Christian saints and uh, how wonderful people they were, you know all the good qualities of devotees and mystic powers and love of God. And so as, as, as a child, I was attracted to this religious sentiment you know, of, of knowing God and, and learning to love Him. And uh, unfortunately, in 1962, there was a uh, ecumenic council that was done in Rome by the Vatican and they decided, all the big cardinals that were running the church without the knowledge of the Pope, the Pope was sick. They, they decided to change the, the Catholic liturgy. They decided to change the, the, everything in the church. In other words, the masses used to be said in, in Latin. So they said, no more Latin. You know, whatever country you live in, it'll be, it'll be said in that language, in English, in French, whatever. And uh, all these books that you have on saints, you throw them away. They, 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 they ordered all the monks, the nuns, the priests to throw away all their philosophy books, all the books that, 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 that describe the, the lives of different saints that have mystic powers. And, and they, they even had to get rid of that Bible that, that spoke about reincarnation. <clears throat> And they, they said, no more statues of the saints and the churches either. You know, Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ on the cross, you take, this all, you take it all down. So the churches became empty from their, from their deities. And uh, after that, that change, it took them another five years to implement everything and to, to actually dismantle the uh, educational system, which is also geared towards God. Because... Each, each school was separated for the girls, another school was for the boys. And across the street, there was always a church where they were, we were taken on a regular basis, practically every day. So all this was, was also dismantled. They started mixing boys and girls in, in, in the schools, and they dismantled the uh, classical course. 
which was a, uh, I guess, a way of training brahmanas back then. So by 1967, the churches were practically empty. You know, people just gave up their faith because everything had been changed and, and it, everything lost its potency. They changed the books, they changed the liturgy, they took all, down all the, all, the, all the statues. And then when people stopped going to church, and those big cardinals started selling land, selling the properties, selling the churches, and they put the money in their pocket. So it, it was like actually the, 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 church, the Catholic church has been taken over by a bunch of demoniac people, you know? And that was practically the end of the Catholic church. So anyhow, by the time I was a teenager, I thought that maybe my teachers who were ordained priests and they had been removed from the schools and sent to, sent to different parishes. And I went to see them and I, I, I started asking them questions, all my spiritual questions that I had about God. And they couldn't answer any of the questions. It's like either they were not allowed to speak anymore about God or, or they didn't know anything. So I was totally frustrated and very disappointed. And that's when I became a hippie. And I got into drugs and, and, and it was easy for me to do because my mother died when I was eight years old. So I was pretty much cut loose, you know. My, my father had to work and so I fell into bad association. And I was still searching and searching, but there was no answer into drugs. Drugs are so terrible, you know, it just, it's just damaged my brain, damaged my teeth. <laughs> so I came to the point practically of suicide. I came this close of committing suicide. But somehow or other by Krishna's mercy, I, I, I met this lady who had an entire library of books on metaphysics, you know. She had every guru uh, that had come by, like Gurdjieff, Horobindo, Ramakrishna. She had books on the the Rosicrucians and the, Ma the Masons and uh, astral projection and uh, the, the, uh, the sort, you know. So I started reading all of them. And still, it was not what I was looking for. But out of it, I, I, I became a vegetarian, even though you know, in the lives of the saints, the, the Catholic saints, many of them were vegetarian, but I had never actually put it in, in, in actuality. So by the time I was 18 years old, I became a vegetarian. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to go to India and find a real guru. You know, that's all I got out of these books. There was nothing about God. <laughs> there, was nothing, there was nothing I was looking for. But from reading the books on astral projection and, and uh, seeing auras, I started practicing it. And I was able to actually read the Vedas in my astral projection. And when I would bring my full consciousness, I would realize I didn't know this language. I was reading Sanskrit. I had never seen that kind of, of language, but I could remember what I was reading. So anyhow, that came useful later when I read the Bhagavad Gita, because I could see that's what I was reading. So. Also, Krishna gave me a little gift of being able to see auras, but I only use it to see auras of people I was interested in seeing auras from. And I was just searching from one guru and, an and, and another. So many had come to America also. So anyway, I had left Canada and I stopped in New York. And there I met this, this black uh, man who was also into some spiritual life. And uh, together we decided to go to India together. So we, we went all the way to Florida and, and we got a job in a Hilton hotel, Miami Hilton. I, I was like a bus boy and he was a, a waiter. He was much older, he was like 35 years old. And somehow or other, I instigated a, a strike in, in the hotel with the bus boys and we got fired. When they found out he was my friend, he got fired too. So we were homeless in, in Miami. And somehow we went to Key West because there was a bunch of hippies living there on the beach and we decided maybe we could do that. And then the moment we arrived there, they were being kicked out by the police. So we had to turn around and hitchhike, hitchhike back. And the first ride we got, 
was a, a, a student at the University of uh, Florida. I was in, in the Coconut Grove. And he, he let us stay at his, at his house on the campus. So we started living there. And, and this black man, he would always be sitting in meditation. He was constantly in trance. His meditation, one of his meditation, was he, he would be looking at the sun, staring at the sun all day. <laughs> Anyhow, he was able to, to see past, present, and future. He was a strange character. In the meantime, I was at the, the park in Coconut Grove, and I was invited by the devotees to go to the Sunday feast. So I went there, and uh, there was a devotee who was a French-Canadian, so he was able to communicate with me pretty well. And he, after the Sunday feast, he told me I should buy the Bhagavad Gita. I told him, oh, how much is it? He said, oh, it's $2. It was the, the average Bhagavad Gita, the one that has just all, the, all the, uh, the, the slokas, but only in English with some of the purports. So I told him, oh, because I was homeless, I don't have $2. And he, got, he became very angry. And he's speaking in my language in French. And he's telling me, you should fast for three days and come up with the money. You know, this book is so important. And I was so embarrassed that when I, when I finally had $2, I was too embarrassed to go to the temple and buy the book, but they, they were distributing them also in the head shops, you know, hippie, hippie shops. So I bought the book from a, a head shop, and I sat down at, on the campus with my in, French-English dictionary for three days like a yogi, and I started translating and reading it. And as, as I was reading it, I realized, wow, this is what I was reading in the astral projection, and this is what I've been looking for. This is the knowledge I was looking for. So it took me three days. On the fourth day, I joined the temple. And I had no idea they got up at 4 o'clock in the morning or, or, or anything. <laughs> but the devotees were so nice, you know. And, and back then, the temple was on one street and the, the ashram was on another street. So our, our uh, Sridham was the temple president in Miami, Florida. And his wife was a man Mohini. And they had a daughter, Nimai. So the, the temple schedule was just Harinam all day, really. You know, we, we would go through the morning program, then eat breakfast, and then all together we would clean up the temple, clean up the kitchen, and go in Harinam, then come back for lunch, and after lunch we'd go in Harinam again. So we did that for so many months. And in Miami it was very hot. But because I was coming from Canada, my body didn't know how to sweat. So for me, I, I felt like a lizard in the sun on the rock, and I, I, I couldn't get enough sun. I was just happy <laughs> being hot. Anyway, one day we were doing door-to-door uh, -door distribution on the campus of, of the University of Florida. We we're selling BTGs. And I came to one of the friends of, 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 of the person that were letting us live there, and he was telling me that this black man that I had left there, who was my friend, he was just taking advantage uh, uh, of this man, and he was not leaving. He was just constantly there, staying there all day, doing nothing. This guy was just in, in meditation. So I felt, I felt uh, responsible for getting him out. So I, I, I told him that, okay, let's hitchhike together and go to Los Angeles. So I left the temple, and we started hitchhiking. And that's when we stopped in different uh, bogey yogis um, assemblies, you know, there were yogis that were advertising and giving so, some, some kind of classes. And as, as I, was, I was going in and looking at them, I could see their auras, and it was just like black smoke. So I didn't spend too much time <laughs> there. I could see it's all bogus. Anyway, by the time I got to uh, our Arizona, I could not convince this black man that actually Krishna consciousness was, was the, the real path. And all he could say was, oh, maybe, perhaps. He, and, and then he told me, actually, you know, I saw, I saw your master getting beaten up in, in, uh, in New York. And when, it, when he said that, I thought, maybe he's saying this just, just to discourage me, you know. So I never really asked him any details about it. Anyhow, it came obvious to me that he was not interested, and I was totally into being a devotee. So I, I told him, we should part our ways. I'm, I'm, I'm going to join the Tucson temple. We're in Arizona. 
So I went to the Tucson temple in the, in the BTGs, the address was there, but no one was home. But they had a garden outside, so I started picking out the, the weeds and cleaning up the whole garden. And by the time night came, they still weren't home. So I, somehow I got inside of the, of the temple and I, I went to sleep with a candle next to me. And in the middle of the night, the devotees came back. There were three devotees. They were preaching at the university there. And when they saw me, they kind of, a little panic. <laughs> But they, they, they saw, okay, maybe he's a devotee. And the next, the next day when the sun came and they saw the garden was cleaned up, they said, oh, okay, I was accepted. <laughs> so I started living with them and, and going to the university. And, and after a, a, a while, they found out that Prabhupada had arrived in Los Angeles. So they, they decided, let's go there. So the four of us, we jumped in that car and we drove all the way to Los Angeles. And we, we got to see Srila Prabhupada. And after a week or so, they said, well, we have to go back, but we're going to come back in two weeks to get initiated. The temple president was going to get second initiation, and the, one of the brahmacharis was getting first initiation, and the other one was getting second. So I stayed in LA, in LA for those two weeks, and it was ecstatic. I mean, there was hundreds of devotees. Prabhupada was giving class every day. And when they came back, unfortunately, they died in a car accident, except for one devotee who survived, they ended up going to the hospital for like eight months in Shringa Chaitanya. So I got to stay in Los Angeles. And Prabhupada stayed probably maybe another month. And uh, when he left, I was so excited. I wanted to follow wherever Prabhupada was going to go. So I, I, I made up in my mind, wherever Prabhupada is going, I'm going. I never asked anyone. <laughs> I just did whatever, <laughs> whatever what my head was thinking. So that, that it, we found out on a Sunday, and Prabhupada was leaving Monday, so on, on Sunday I, I was all excited and I was given the, the duty to mop the uh, sanctuary after the Sunday feast. So I was running down from the Brahmachari ashram with a mop bucket and the, the mop ringer fell off onto my foot and broke one of my toes. So all of a sudden my foot became like a football and <laughs> all of a sudden I couldn't go nowhere. And then the next day, the temple president, Karandar, calls me in the office. He says, you know, Dr. Jacques, you know, it's, I think it's time now you should, you should start getting shaved up. And, you know, also, you know, you, you should choose some steady service. You know, you, you can choose either to wash pots all day in the kitchen or to learn how to run the printing, pre the printing presses. So I thought, well, maybe I'll learn how to run the printing presses. So I was sent to an old warehouse it was the BBT warehouse where Ramashwar had already some, some, some books and that, that was being distributed. And there was a small printing press and Raghunandan taught me how to run the printing press. And Raghunandan was a very dynamic devotee. He knew all the phases of, of printing. So he was very busy also. We were printing for uh, all the temples in America, their mantra cards and their letterheads and, and envelopes. and. There are Sunday feast leaflets and uh, posters for Rathyatra and for preaching programs for Ridananda and Satsuruk Maharaj. So like that, over time, he, he built up the press with more machines and, and paper cutters and cameras and, and it became a big operation. But we were the only two that could run the machines. And over time, He started acting strange, you know. Like one Sunday, I, for one Sunday feast, I, I drew a, a, a picture of Lord Jagannath for the Sunday feast program as an invitation to come to the Sunday feast. And it was all done psychedelically because I was a hippie and that's the only type of drawing I knew. <laughs> and he started running the press with this artwork and he looked out at the, the first page and he started laughing. He said, oh, Lord Jagannath looks like a, a mad hatter. Because I guess I must have drawn the... And just as he said that, his, his japa finger, this middle finger, got caught in the machine. And it, the machine just jammed. And I don't think we ever printed this. The rest, <laughs> this leaflet never came out. But from this point on, he kind of became crazy. I thought maybe that was because he had, he had insulted Lord Jagannath, but actually it's because his, his, uh, 
his nervous system could not assimilate uh, vegetarian protein. And the doctor told him that he should take this, these pills that had some kind of meat product. And he was such a fanatic, he did not want to take. So over, over a period of time, he became crazy, totally crazy. So I was left to run the, these machines. So I guess they, they sent me one devotee to teach how to run the machine. Devotees, they, they, it, was, it was not their expertise. You know, you have to be a real <laughs> mechanic mudha <laughs> to do that kind of work. It's really, you know, top anxiety. You have to be mechanically inclined and running from one end to the other, worrying about everything, the ink, the water, the impression, the, how the paper is fed and the, the register, anyway. So I was trying to teach a, dev a new a devotee how to, to run the small machine. By then we had a big machine also that could do color. So as I'm trying to explain to him, I lost focus and I cut my little finger in the same little printing press. And this devotee got so scared that he ran out. And by that time we were in a big warehouse. You know, Spiritual Sky had purchased a huge warehouse and, and the BBT had many books there and all the Spiritual Sky incense and all the products they were selling. And I was at the end of the warehouse with all the machines, and this devotee had abandoned me. <laughs> I, was stuck, I was stuck in the machine. By Krishna's mercy, when I opened the door of the machine, there was an Allen wrench that was uh, sufficient to be able to dismantle. So slowly I dismantled the machine, got the roll out, and then I ran upstairs where Jaitirtha was in the office for Spiritual Sky, and I showed him my finger, Prabhu, I might have to go to the hospital. And it was flat like a piece of, of paper. <laughs> and when he saw it, he, he almost passed out. But anyway, he took me to the hospital. And uh, it's funny, there I met Sridham, my temple president from Miami. And he, he had gotten some operation. And he started speaking with me, saying that, oh, yeah, when I get better, I'm going to start giving classes again. And he, he was my inspiration. Sridham was like, he, he gave me love for Prabhupada. You know, he, he was trained by Prabhupada to play Majanga and to cook. and So everything he did, you could see Prabhupada in him. So, so I was all happy that he, he, somehow or other he had moved to L.A. I didn't know all the intricacies, but two weeks later, he was gunned down. He was shot to death. And uh, yeah, he, apparently he had, he had fallen in love with the, 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 the wife of another devotee and moved from Miami to Los Angeles. That's, that's why he was there. And uh, that devotee followed him and uh, with a gun just, just decided to, uh, to kill him for taking his wife. So that was the end of my first temple president. That was the end of my, the devotees that I knew in Tucson. So anyway, I was in Los Angeles running the printing presses. And because I was the only person running all these big machines, it, and also I had, you know, from doing drugs, all my teeth were rotten. I had a cavity in every one of my teeth. Yeah, it, so at the UCLA campus, you could get your teeth fixed for free by the, the students of uh, the dentistry. But you had to stay the whole day there with your mouth open, and they would do some work. The teacher would come and look, make sure it was done right, and so it took forever. But I took advantage of using the library, and I, I, I remembered Prabhupada saying that Miracle, uh, uh, milk was a, a perfect food, you know, it was a miracle food. And sure enough, I found a, a book that was published in 1952, and the title was Milk, Miracle Food, and it was a study by, by scientists how milk was a perfect food stuff. And even though it did not contain all the, the ingredients for nutrition, when you digest it, the, the, the missing ingredients were created by a combination of their, of their ingredients. So I said, wow, but then maybe I should try, I, I will put it in practice. So I decided I was just going to live on two quarts of milk a day and a couple of fruits. And the milk we used to get back then was from the, the dairy after it was expired. We told them we had a, a, a pig farm, so they gave us the milk for free, but we were using it for everything. So anyhow, during the day I would drink one, one quart of milk and at night I would put I would put the, the leftover hot milk prashanam from the evening. I would go in the temple room and get some charnamrita out and put it in the, in the, the milk container. And overnight it would become yogurt. So I would have one cup, one, one quart of yogurt 
in one qu uh, quart of milk a day. And that's how I lived for five months while I was running the printing presses. <laughs> and I, I, I had plenty of energy, so I realized, yeah, that's true. You can live on milk alone. And that milk was not the first class milk either. But anyhow, during these, these two first years that I joined the movement, my sisters back in Canada, they had joined this Guru Maharaji. And I was in total distress because it, 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 it was such a bogus thing that he, he, he was claiming, actually his mother was claiming that he was Krishna. And anyhow, somehow they fell for this nonsense. And I remember actually hitchhiking back to Canada and trying to convince them and, and, and going to, to some of his meetings. They, they called it satsangas and, and just preaching totally against the, against them you know but they would let me do it because my sisters were so close to the inner group that they forgave all my offenses <laughs> anyhow but in, in back in los angeles I, I was it was i was i was meditating on you now this man cannot go on cheating people like this i i started thinking maybe i should take him down you know i should like kill him and without <clears throat> Without asking anyone uh, advice or anything, I put that in my mind and, and, and I decided to, that I was going to quit the press. And just at the same time, uh, Chandan Acharya, who, who was working with the, the press in Boston and then in New York, he was, he was given the press in, in, the, in LA to, to take charge of since Raghunandan was no longer there. And the first meeting, he was also French Canadian. He asked, he, he got all the, the staff together and, and he asked, well, since now I'm taking over, anyone that doesn't want to work with our team, you know, just raise your hand, I'm, I'm, you, you, he can go. So I raised my hand and he let me go. Uh, and, and just shortly after that, because it, it was big nonsense for me to give up the, the, the press because no one else could be trying to, do, to run the machines. It, eventually they had to sell all the equipment. So that was a big a big Maya, you know, on my part. But I was fixed on going to kill this Guru Maharaj. Imagine if Krishna had let me do something like that, how horrible it would have been for the movement. Then I was put, I couldn't even put a dhoti on, so I was reading Bhagavad Gita for a while, so that's what I needed. And then I was put on, the, uh, on Guru Kripa's traveling party in California. And that's when I gave up my... Uh, my five months of, of just living on milk alone because it, the, the, the cuts were not healing very fast. And then we, when we came back to Los Angeles, I was not much of a book distributor. I don't think I could even collect the, the, the amount of money to pay for the, the doll that we ate. They, it was a, a strange program, pretty austere. They dropped you off in a mall for like the whole day. <laughs> they picked you up at eight o'clock at night. So. It was not much of my uh, style of, uh, <laughs> plus I could barely speak proper English and anyway. So when we got back to Los Angeles, there was a devotee, Mat Maturadesh, I think his name. He, he was the son of a devotee and he wanted to go on the party. So I said, good, let's switch. <laughs> so he, he went, he went on, on Guru Kupra's party and he did very good. And, and he, they took him to Japan and he was a big collector and they, they helped build Vrindavan and uh, Mayapur. Anyhow, so at that point, I, I decided to go to India. I went to Bombay, and it was such a, a, a cultural shock to me. I, I was from Canada. And <laughs> India was such a, a scary thing for me that I could only stay like two weeks. That's, that was, there was no temple in Juhu, Juhu Beach yet. Anyway, so I came back to America. Then I went to New Rindavan. Anyhow, it just goes on and on. <laughs>